happy Sabbath again. You know, I don't ever get tired of saying that on Sabbath. We don't say happy Sunday or happy Tuesday, do we? Not normally, because usually those are the days that we're working or something's going on. That, But God put a blessing on this day. It should be happy for us. We should be joyful that we can come into the house of the Lord and that we can meet with fellow believers. Turn with me to Isaiah 9. We'll take a look at verse 6. It's a verse that probably most of us know very, very well. It's a verse that is describing whom? Jesus Christ. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. Now, in most families, a child being born is what? Joyous, happy. I mean, this is a, this is a neat thing. We're, we're having a child. In fact, is, yesterday we had stopped to get something to eat after Lynn's doctor's appointment. And the young man who waited on me, he was just kind of bubbling over. And, you know, he said, I just graduated high school. I said, well, that's good. Congratulations. That, that's a good thing to do. And I said, you're going to go to college? No, we're having a child. Okay. And, but he was happy. And I said, well, that's, that's good. I said, a child will bring you a lot of joy. There's a lot of work. He said, yeah, I know. He said, I've got to get a job. And, but the point of it is, is to a total stranger, he was happy to say that he, was, he and his wife, girlfriend, whatever, was going to have a child. It's a happy time. Should be a happy time. Unto us a son is given, and in most families a son is what is wanted. The government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Probably of all of those titles for us today in our world, Prince of Peace is what we need more than anything. There is no peace in our world. There just isn't. All the others, we need all of those things. But I don't know about you, but I come to Friday and I, I have peace the next day. I don't have to work on the house. I don't have to whatever. I can have peace in Jesus Christ. The island of New Guinea, for a long time, when I was a child, I remember reading stories and hearing stories of New Guinea. And they were always exciting stories because in New Guinea, the people there were headhunters, cannibals, and this was, you know, that's not something we deal with. But missionaries went there. Missionaries took the gospel of Jesus Christ to these natives. And over a period of a number of decades, New Guinea has changed. It's not a country of headhunters and cannibals anymore. Christianity has made huge inroads into the peoples of that nation. Um, in fact, as I remember not too long back, a mission spotlight went to New Guinea and was showing some of the Christians who formerly had been, or whose ancestors had been, um, cannibals and headhunters. The story that I'm going to relate, and it is a true story, happened probably most of 50 years ago. Missionaries arrived in a remote village, and they were met with suspicion they were met with a little bit of, well, we don't know who you are. We're not sure. You don't look like us. But they were allowed to stay. They brought with them gifts, things that the, these backward people, as far as our ideas of living in society, you know, they hadn't seen steel knives or axes or they didn't have some of these things, and it intrigued them. Well, the missionaries 
asked if they could talk to the people. Yeah, that's okay. So they began the story of Christ, the story of Jesus. They began telling them of this man who raised the dead, who healed people, who went around doing good for those around. And the natives listened um, very carefully. Not a whole lot of expression. Night after night, they told pieces of the story of Jesus Christ. And night after night, the people came and listened. Then one evening, they came to the closing scenes of Jesus' life. And they talked about the upper room. They talked about Judas' betrayal. And then they went, talked about the crucifixion, that Christ was killed. And for the first night, the crowd reacted. There was talking and whispering. There was laughter and more talking. Well, the missionaries wondered what, you know, what has happened that they've suddenly taken this interest and they've become um, talkative about it. There, there's emotion being uh, displayed. So they asked the translator, what, what's wrong or what's right? What's going on? His answer startled them. They really liked Judas. In their society, to treat someone as a friend and yet at some point betray him was considered a great thing. That was a great man who could pull off that kind of a deal. Oh, they liked Judas. Fact is, every evening after that, the only story they wanted to hear was the story of how Judas had treated Jesus as a friend and had betrayed him and gotten him killed. Well, needless to say, the missionaries were at a loss. How, you know, this is not the message that they want to get across. This is not the message of who Jesus is. But it is the message that the people heard because of their society, because of their own background. And try as they might, they could not get the people to want any other story. The point of it came that the missionaries finally told the people, we're going to have to move on to another village, a village where, you know, we might be more, you might be, they might be more receptive to our message. It's interesting because the people didn't really want them to go. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3, and we're going to take a look at verses 14 and 15. Genesis 3, 14 and 15. So the Lord God said to the serpent, <clears throat> because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Well, what happened? Adam and Eve had been created, perfect, had been placed in a beautiful garden, told that's your home, take care of it. They had daily communion face to face with God and they were warned that there is a being out there who doesn't worship God, who is in rebellion, and that being is going to try to cause you to fall, cause you to sin. And it had happened. 
Adam and Eve had fallen. They had eaten of the fruit. They had sinned. And death was the penalty. But God did not leave Adam and Eve without hope. Here in verses 14 and 15, God speaking to the serpent, the devil, told him these things. You're cursed. You're going to go on your belly. Enmity between her seed and your seed. Her seed will bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. Adam and Eve took this to, to mean and were given the understanding that at some point salvation was going to be offered. And they were told, a child of Eve will be the savior of your race. After what they had been through, they were joyful that this was a possibility, that they weren't going to have no salvation. But we humans tend to um, take something like this and go with it maybe more than it needs to be. They joyfully welcomed. Who was their firstborn? Cain. Eve had a son. They named him Cain. And they were sure he was going to be the salvation, the Savior. Hoping that he might be the deliverer from their sinful world that they lived in. And you have to stop and think just a minute. Compared to our world today, what was the Garden of Eden like after sin? Have you ever thought about it? Did thorns suddenly appear? Or did that take some time? We know things did change. We know that Adam and Eve lost their clothing of light and had to have clothing of skins. So there must have been some chill. But I don't anticipate that suddenly the garden turned thorns and thistles and all this kind of thing. But they had had enough of sin already from compared to the perfection of the world they had, were in that they were hoping that Cain would be that deliverer. We'll look over in Genesis 4. We'll look at verses 7 and 8. <clears throat> Actually, 6, 7, and 8. Cain and Abel, we know the story that they had Cain, then they had Abel. And as they grew up, at some point they became men. I'm assuming they were men at this time because of the description. Abel had flocks and sheep. Cain was a gardener. I'm sure he had the most beautiful fruits and vegetables. But when they were asked to bring an offering, Abel brought a lamb. That's what was asked. Cain brought his fruit. And God said, fruit's not going to get it. Lovingly. There was nothing in God's uh, demeanor to Cain to indicate that he was angry with him. He just said, this is not what I asked for. And from our point of view, Cain could have gone to Abel and said, look, I'll, I'll give you some, you know, I've got some tomatoes and whatever. I, I need a lamb. Can we make a trade? And I'm sure Abel said, sure, no problem. But the point of it is, is that Cain didn't do that. In verse 6, so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and it's desirous for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel and killed him. We know the story. How do you think Eve must have felt? Her firstborn, who she had hoped would be the deliverer, is now the first murderer. Not pleasant. 4,000 years travels by. Go with me through the ages. We won't touch on most of the people who lived in there. The promise had not been fulfilled yet. 4,000 years down the line, the world was a vastly different place than Adam and Eve knew. 
we see Mary told by an angel, you're going to have a child. This child's going to be something very, very, very special. This child is going to be the savior of the world. The angel talked with Joseph. Mary's with child. There's been no intimate relations. Joseph's going to put her away quietly. This is not a good thing. Angels don't do that. The child that Mary's going to have is very special. You need to take care of Mary and that child. The long-awaited Messiah was there. The shepherds visit. The wise men visit. Joseph warned in another dream to flee to Egypt. And now he had the money to do it. The gifts of the Magi. And told in another dream to go back to Israel after Herod was dead. Jesus grows up. We don't see a lot in scripture about it other than that he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. And he started his ministry. His first miracle was what? Something really great? No. <laughs> Water to wine. A marriage ceremony, a marriage feast, and they've run out of the the good drink, the wine. And as every mother is to her son, Mary goes to Jesus and says, they're running out of wine. And Jesus answers, so? I mean, that's what the script, the indication. There was no nothing but love in that answer, I'm sure. But that didn't deter Mary at all. Went to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. And Jesus did. Pour water in here. Gallons of water into these big stone pots. Fill them up full. Now, take a dipper and take it to the master of the feast. Can you see these servants? Oh, we just put water in there and you're going to have us take it. Okay, she said to, to do what he said. And the miracle had taken place. He called 12 disciples. Well, he called 11. He accepted the 12th. Judas. We've studied the parables, the miracles, the healings. And then Judas betrays Jesus. for the price of a slave. We know the story of Jesus' trials after trial between, uh, in front of Caiaphas, Annas, Pilate, Herod, Pilate. All night long he's drug around, whipped, beaten, into the next day when he comes before Pilate again and he finally rules and says, crucify him. I wash my hands of it. How much did God do for us? For our salvation? All that could be done for our salvation was done. God didn't hold anything back. He gave his only son to die for us so that we might have eternal life. We know the story. I hope we appreciate the story to the extent that we probably should. The missionaries were packing up their things, getting ready to leave that little village in the highlands of New Guinea. And suddenly there was a commotion in the village. There was noise and shouting and, and they wondered what was going on and so they asked the translator, what's, what's happening here? And they were told that there was going to be peace between this village and a nearby village. And the missionaries 
knew that there was contention between them and had urged peace upon the people, but it hadn't happened. Now that they were getting ready to leave, it was kind of a bit of an impetus to these villagers to maybe get something going. Bloodshed and war was the norm between these. One village would kill somebody in another village, and then there would be killings in return, like the uh, Hatfields and McCoys. Constant warring between them. How in the world, these missionaries thought, could they possibly stop this bloodshed that's gone on for generations? And they were told, there is a way, and we know how to do it. It is called a peace child. In doing my research on this, it's interesting that once there was one peace child, then almost always one from that village was sent to the other. So there were two peace, child, peace children. So that both villages would have living with them a member of the other village <coughs> a very special member of the other village. As long as that peace child stayed alive, there would be peace. They agreed to it. And anybody hurting a peace child was considered to be extremely evil and was a threat to the peace and the safety of both villages. So this process began Six-month-old baby boy was the first peace child while the missionaries was there. And he was brought by his father to the head man of the village and said, I'm giving you my child as a peace child. By the way, his wife was not in agreement. She had tried to stop him, and she had actually slipped and fallen in the mud, and he had gone there and... It went forward. And you can understand a mother will not want to give her tiny little baby away. But then shortly thereafter, a mother in the village, the father gave the child to the other village. So this is what a peace child is. Well, the missionaries listened to this story, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, they knew or they felt they had a way to make the gospel known to these people in a way that they would accept it. <clears throat> so they asked, can we have another meeting? And the people, sure, we'll come to the meeting. Only now, they told the story from a different point of view. They told of the fall of mankind. They told of sin and how horrible it was. And then they told of the Son of God who became a peace child, born in Nazareth. They told of Herod trying to kill Jesus. They told of Mary and Joseph fleeing to save the child. And believe me, the people were quite happy about the story. This, yeah, they're protecting the peace child. This is a good thing. They told the story of Jesus from the point of being that the God of heaven had sent his own son to bring peace, true, eternal peace, to this world. Now, when they came to the closing scenes of Christ's life, the attitude and the um, how the people felt about the story changed totally. Judas was no longer a great man. Judas, by betraying the peace child, was bringing upon this world the possibility of war in their, in, from their point of view, from how they looked at things. Judas was now a villain. Now Jesus wanted to know about, not the people want to know about Jesus, the peace child. Salvation came to the village. They had an understanding of now of what sin and what God would do for them. And so the missionaries didn't leave the village. 
not only did they not leave the village, they were asked to go to the neighboring village where the other peace child was and tell the same story. So the Christianity and salvation was brought to, the, to these villages in New Guinea. Isaiah says that Christ is the Prince of Peace, and yet he was born as a child. So I would submit to you that Christ is the peace child for our whole world. And at time, this time of year, we celebrate that. I mean, we do. Christians all over the world celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ and celebrate the fact that he came. And I think most of them also celebrate the fact that he eventually died and was raised so that that whole plan is in place. But what will we do with heaven's peace child? Will we, and there are those in the world who don't believe in Christ, they don't want anything to do with Jesus. They don't understand what he's done for them. Are our lives lived in harmony with what our Savior wants to do for us or what he would have us do? Do we cherish the things of this world to the point that we do not give our all to our Savior? I would submit that it is our duty to dedicate our lives to Christ each and every day. Now, I haven't been here very many weeks, and I think most of you have heard me on multiple sayings say that you got to surrender your life to him every day. You can't do it once and be done. It has to be daily. In fact, is it probably in rea reality has to be moment by moment, that as you face problems in your life, that you go to Christ with those problems, that you go to our Savior. Because he said, I care about you. I care about everything you do. I care about all that you are. Let me take care of you. If we do that, then he truly becomes our peace. We can have peace no matter what's going on around us because we know God is taking care of us. We need to make the renewal of our, our life to him a daily, starting today. So I would submit to you, I would present to you Jesus Christ, the peace child, Someday he's coming back. Someday soon he's coming back. And this world will have peace. And all the beings who will be here when it is recreated will be in peace and harmony with the God of the universe for eternity.